Welcome again, Touch Heaven. Good morning to you. Good morning, sir. Those of you who are joining us online, thank you for wherever you're at. Those watching at another time zone, thank you for wherever you're at. Um, we are plodding on in a series that, that I began some weeks back on uh, 10 life-changing steps to transform your life into your destiny. And um, it's taken various places and phases and steps, and I don't want to review all of that with you now. I would suggest that if it interests you at all, that uh, you just let them know, and when it's completed, you can get the whole set of the teaching. Uh, I do believe it's timely. I know it's timely, and I know that it's been helpful for many of you and those of you who've reached back out to us. But I want to add this into that step a, a little bit today. Uh, one, of the, one of the catalysts that we need that helps us to be able to appropriate and access everything that we need is faith. And uh, in troubling times, faith uh, is even more necessary. And faith isn't obscure, but it helps us when we understand what it means by a measure of faith. So I just want to ask you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to guide us and keep us, make this simple, make it expedient, and help us to grasp it. Let it be something, Father, that speaks to our hearts and helps us to move. I wrote to you that uh, faith, there was a time when I cried out, Lord, I want to know perfect faith. Interestingly enough, these things come back at times, and Jim sent me something that I had asked him to keep for me. Uh, way, way, way back, uh, when I say way, way, way back, it was about nine or ten years ago, and I had uh, written uh, this statement about, uh, about faith, and I had sent it forward and uh, asked Jimmy to keep the notes for me. It was something that I had released both uh, on television and also to a very large church that I was the English pastor in. And at that time, I was quite moved because a uh, Nigerian man showed up, a pastor, in uh, our offices in Doral, Florida. Uh, this was uh, our construction offices in Doral, Florida. And he had tracked me down and found me, and he had heard something that I had uh, spoken of and said, and he had seen me on television, and he said that it spoke to him and moved to him, and that um, he had come from Nigeria to find me and to uh, have a word with me, and if I would uh, be so kind as to counsel or minister to him because he was at a very difficult crossroads in his life. He was looking for his identity, number one, and number two, he was trying to merge into his destiny, and he felt a tug. And of course, we are those that are right now on a journey going forward and asking about merging into our destinies. And so, uh, this man came from, uh, some say, the largest active church in the world. It's in Lagos, and they have millions of members, and uh, it's a very wealthy church. It has uh, rights to gas and oil leases and all kind of income, um, billions of dollars, in fact, and, uh, and this man had uh, grown up in that church, and he had found himself to a place where he had been appointed and promoted and finally was the senior youth pastor, sort of an oxymoron, senior youth, isn't it? The senior youth pastor, and he had uh, over a million youth that he was uh, responsible for, and there were all kind of other pastors that were set up in segments. He had a very large position in this massive church, um, and he got, felt the tug of God, and he was somewhat agitated uh, by a message I gave. And uh, I don't remember the message exactly, but I know the uh, tone of what I was talking about. 
and it's the tone I've been talking about for a while, and it's intensifying, and that is that the Lord was shaking the church, and that it was time for the church and bride to wake up and to no longer walk as a hybrid, as both a goat and a sheep, no longer to walk with one foot in the light and one foot in the dark, and to, to be listening to and adhering to rituals and talismans and things that really were contrary to preparing us for the time that we're entering into. Now, knowing that that was approximately 10 years ago, we've matured into that time 10 years more. And now that message seems to be going out a little bit more and a little bit more, and more and more people are becoming uh, anticipating that, yes, the world is getting very dark, that it's not going to get brighter, that it's going to continue to get dark, and that the message that Timothy said, that there would be a falling away of the church, that there would be a falling away of people, that evildoers uh, would deceive and be deceived. And uh, he, he basically had a message also for the church. And the church was that when you see this falling away and you see humanity beginning to uh, focus itself on, on more of its, of its own needs, its own flesh, and the systems of the world working contrary to the things of God in an accelerated basis, get excited because the Lord's getting prepared to come. He's not going to come back without this falling away. Now, that's prophetic. That's of the Bible. What and why, I have no idea. I would believe that part of it is that the Lord is finally going to say at one moment when the Father tells the Son, now's the time to go, that it's so close that we would not be able to be redeemed again that uh, it's time to come, because that's where we seem to be racing towards. And so this man was agitated by what I had said. He looked at his environment around him. He looked at the structure around him. He looked at specifically the lack of power in their church. He said, we don't have power. You walk in power. You talk power. You preach power. We need power. And when I bring it up, he said, I'm, I'm shut down and I'm not allowed to move in that power. We're not allowed to move in that power. And so uh, <laughs> when he sat down with me, I can remember his face vividly in our conference room up by the windows. And I was looking and listening to him more than I was talking, quite moved that he came all around the world to get a word. I felt a demand and, and, and a responsibility uh, to be as, as uh, uh, focused and as quality for him as I could. And uh, I said to him, you've already come to me with your answer. What is it you're asking me to give you? And he looked at me, and uh, I then began to prophesy over him uh, things that uh, had happened in his life and things that, that uh, he was really uh, caring with himself in his private life. Um, and I can share it because you don't know who he was. Uh, there was. He was married for several years, no intimacy. His wife and I were staying in, op his wife and he were staying in op uh, uh, different rooms, opposite rooms in the home. Uh, they barely talked and saw each other, but yet they both were serving in the church. And, uh, and I said, uh, your life reminds me of the book of Hosea. And he said, why is that? I said, well, the Lord had him find out how the relationship was with God because of his relationship with a wife that he would betroth to himself. Your relationship with your wife is the way that the church's relationship is with the Lord. He said, wow. And I said, in different rooms. And uh, having a form of godliness, but no power thereof. That's what the word requires in these last days. And I said, so I have an answer for you. And you already have given me the answer. Are you going to stay where you're at and pretend that you're serving God? Or are you going to move on and find out what the Lord has for you? He said, well, I have been thinking about stopping or, or, or starting a small church in a storefront that I own. I said, bingo, there's your answer. I said, what will you do in that church? He said, I don't know, but I'll be free to pursue what God wants me to do. I said, well, sir, I'm sorry you spent all this money to come and see me for me to tell you you already have the answer, but there's your answer. Go home and do what you have said. And I said, and I would uh, encourage you to try to heal that relationship with your wife because at that time he was considering 
also separating from her. I said, you need to separate the two things. You're separating from a religious situation. God wouldn't tell you to separate from your wife. He said, well, here's the problem. She wants to stay in our position at that church. I said, I can't answer that one for you other than to tell you you must go as God leads you. That doesn't mean you need to separate from your wife. Maybe she'll follow you. Maybe she won't. You're in separate rooms anyway. What's the difference? You're not talking about anything. So uh, it was almost practical. I give you that example because I cried out um, uh, in that same message, and my cry was that, Lord, I want to know perfect faith. Is it possible for me to know perfect faith? Well, first of all, you know, we need to talk a little bit about faith. And many of you have been under a lot of faith teachings, and of course, faith is, is, is a foundation of what we grow in and move in. Um, but I was crying out, Lord, I want to know perfect faith. And I was given uh, these scriptures to look at. And I'd like us to go to Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And I want to take some time to read this very, very uh, well-known, popular part of gospel of Jesus walking on the water and Peter coming out with him. I don't know if we're going to get it on the screen. I'll wait one more minute. But there it is, uh, Matthew 14, 22. Now, let me give you a little bit of, uh, of laying some groundwork for this. Jesus had just finished the experience, the, the wonderful, miraculous miracle of what they call feeding the 5,000. Actually, it was more than 5,000. It was also the women and children. It's like the deliverance from Egypt for the Israelites. It was 3 million plus the women and children and those that came forth. So we had 5,000 people plus the women and children that he fed with a few loaves and, they, and, and, and a little bit of fish. And uh, so the people were following him and they were putting a demand on him. So uh, he, he told, and this had to happen, uh, they had run off down towards uh, the Lake of Galilee, Gennesaret, and immediately it says he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. The crowds wouldn't leave him alone. They were putting a demand on him, and they, they wanted the miracles, and of course he had compassion. So if we go on, I'm going to read the scriptures as we go. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray, and when evening came, he was there all by himself. He was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Next scripture. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. The fourth watch of the night is 6 a.m. in the morning. I know because my watch of the night is 3 a.m. in the morning. That's the third night. The fourth night is so it's really the break of the morning. And uh, he came to them walking on the sea. And in, and, and, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. Interesting. Next. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he became afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got him into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, perfect faith. I don't think there's a greater example that I know of. Well, there is a couple course, Christ on the cross. Father, to thy hands I commend my spirit. But this one between a, a fleshly man and the Lord himself is quite a communication, and it teaches us a little bit of the revelation of the mystery of how do we receive and act and move in a moment of perfect faith. 
So while we understand this, uh, we, we need to understand that what is being talked about is what is the substance of this faith, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of which is not seen. There's a substance to faith. Now, one thing I want to do as we keep that theme is to build back up to it for a moment. Another comment I made, in fact, it actually has it dated January 24 of 2013. I amazed myself with some of this stuff. I said, don't conceive what you don't want to give birth to. Don't conceive what you don't want to give birth to. And today, there are lots of things being birthed through the body of Christ that it would be better to never been conceived. And there are many things being birthed inside of believers and attempts being made to birth things, to plant seeds inside of you and I that we should reject because seeds will grow and they will conceive. And the comment is, don't conceive what you don't want to give birth to. We need to protect the gates of our eyes, our hearts, our mouths, our ears. We need to protect everything that has some way of entering into us and to filter it with faith. To filter, first of all, with base faith. Base faith says that God is. Base faith says God is. Base faith then grows and says Jesus is Lord. Base faith then grows some more and says Jesus is Lord. He died for my sins and he was also man. Now our faith is growing. And we grow to the point in that faith that our foundation as believers uh, albeit Christians, is that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that He is above all things, that He died for our sins. And because He died for our sins, we can be saved and live eternally forevermore. Now, that's a great faith. And that faith is enough. That faith is enough to satisfy the question that the Lord has given, do we believe in Him? But as I've said many times, I will celebrate with somebody that someone got saved. That's a wonderful thing, but let's not continue to celebrate that forever because they really, you know, it's like flipping a coin, yes or no. Yes, you're saved. No, you're not saved. You make a choice. It's moving beyond that that we need to grow in faith and to understand what a measure of faith is. Now, today, Judgment has indeed begun in the house of the Lord. And the house of God, in most parts, is blind and doesn't see it. Isn't it interesting that, you know, when one is embroiled in their own personality, their own egos, their own agendas, their own things, it usually takes somebody outside of, of that sphere to bring reality into the point and let one know that they're really not what they think they are, or something needs to be changed, or it isn't really as palatable and as wonderful as you think it is. Um, God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. I mean, truthfully, the Lord could cast judgment on a vast majority of the population of the earth for, the, for, for our foul spirits, our foul ways, and the things that we don't do and that we do do. But God has given us Jesus Christ and made us righteous. However, there's a boldness that comes in a righteousness that isn't always of God. There's a boldness in righteousness that's of God, and that's good. I am the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and because of that, I can enter into the throne room of God. Therefore, there is nothing that can condemn me. That's a good boldness, and that's a measure of faith that we want to move in. But on the opposite pendulum of that is another boldness of righteousness, which also is linked to grace, right? God is gracious. God's grace is good. I can do anything I want or everything that I do, God's going to cover in the blood. And uh, I'm going to be just fine because I am the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So people continue on living some of the same lives that we had before we were supposedly transformed and changed. That's the hybrid. That's the gray area. That's the lukewarm temperature. That's the one where we have to be very careful because the Lord says there will be that day when people will be before him and he will separate between the goats and the sheep. And those goats are believers. 
Those aren't unbelievers. Those are believers. So there's something there that causes these things to be what they are. There's a boldness in righteousness that's good unto God and a boldness in righteousness that works against us in our relationship with God. Now, there is a move of God going on about the earth. And it's not as celebrated as some of the other moves of God that are going on within different denominations and in churches. In fact, we've seen that some of those moves have come to a halt. Some of the moves that you know, are post-Pentecostal, I call it the Pentecostal era, and uh, moving into the prophetic and apostolic area in the 90s and the 2000s and into now, they've sort of come to a halt in a sense because as some moving in different areas think that that's the ultimate, the Lord always has another level, another measure of faith. And the ultimate isn't the prophetic and the apostolic. God is doing another new thing in the earth now. And that thing is that he's bringing his people to repentance, to repentance. What got lost in a lot of the moves, especially since Azusa Street, as things went through and the boldness of righteousness uh, was working against this move to repentance, was the fact of the need to know that there needs to be repentance within the body of Christ. We're very quick to tell other people who don't know Jesus they need to repent. We're very slow to tell ourselves, I need to repent. And that there are things in our lives that we need to cleanse and move. But the Lord said he was releasing that spirit of Elijah again before the coming and the dreadful day of the Lord. And that spirit of Elijah, we've already seen how it operates. It operates in repentance. John the Baptist came preaching a message of repentance. That was his miracle. That was his gift, the greatest prophet of all, as we're told. Repentance. And so the spirit of Elijah is pouring out, and there's a great move upon the earth right now. And that move upon the earth isn't being celebrated a lot. You're not hearing about it a lot. You turn on the television, you don't see it a lot. It's not being printed about it a lot. We hear a lot about miracles, and we hear a lot about all of the, uh, of, of the different signs and wonders that we want to hear about. We have so many prophetic voices out there. You can just, you know, delude yourself with, with, with zillions of prophecies every year. Somebody has something to say every hour, all day long, and, and it's, you know, what does it really do for us? I don't know. Um, but I, this I do know, that there's a move for repentance, and it's moving about the earth right now. And that God is pouring out a fresh revelation upon people, and he's raising up an end-time army. Now, it's not the kind of an army that we might have thought would be raised up because it's a quiet army. It's an army that's raising up inside of people, inside their hearts, inside their families, inside their churches. Just like the man from Nigeria that came across the other side of the earth to find out an answer that he already had inside of him, so do we. And that answer is Jesus is coming. And because Jesus is coming, we need to to, to preach a message of repentance to the body of Christ. And the business of the ministry is foul. The business of the ministry is a huge barrier to sincere hearts in Christ. And the business of the ministry is a hard thing for people to let go of and to be let go of. Because there's so, so, so much security in the business of a ministry. But God is saying it's time to change it. Now, in Romans 12, 3, I'd like to read this to you a moment. Romans 12, 3, and it talks about a measure of faith. If possible, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned This was a letter written to the Romans preparing for Paul to come. They didn't really know Paul. And so in this thesis, Paul is setting out a lot of things. And in the same context, as you read it, he also begins to talk about the diversity of gifts and gifts. And of course, we know that from Corinthians as well. And we begin to understand that as we look at it in a broader context, immediately following, as you would get into a gift of all believers in verse 6, It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So there's a measure of faith from which this measure of faith comes the gifts. But unfortunately, 
The gifts have overwhelmed the measure of faith. People are measuring more of what they want and expect from God from the gifts than they do about the measure of faith. We shouldn't look at God as a giver so much as, as a giver of faith so much as we should as faith himself. He's faith himself. God's already given us the measure of faith. So the real key for us, the revelation for us to grow in faith is to grow in him, to get closer to him, to stay in him. In him we live and move, we have our being. Remember we discussed last week that to be in the Lord is to wait, is to come to a place of being able to wait. We're resting in that place with him. We're still moving, but we're in a place of rest and moving. And in that same place, we have faith that's growing and faith that is measured for the time that we need it in. Now, a measure of faith could be something with substance that's given to each one of us. And it's that measure of faith that we get for, yes, first of all, to love God, believe God, and to know God, and secondly, for the things of God. But there's a measure of faith that also I believe and have experienced in my life is in different levels and measures to address the experience and the need of that moment. There are times when common faith works. Common faith. God is able. I believe God in this. I'm not going to give it any more time. That's a common faith that's moving. But there are other times when we need resurrection power faith. There's other times when we need to resurrect something from the dead, when we need to know that God is moving with something good that's coming out of something that's bad. It's called resurrection power. Paul gave us a little bit of a gleam of that revelation when he said in Philippians 3.10 that we might know him. That's part of faith. Part of the faith is to know him as God the Father, God the Son, and God uh, the Holy Ghost, and that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, to know him and the power. That's a higher level of faith. To know the power is to be operating in a higher level of faith that gets us as close to perfect faith as we can get to. And then he says, to do that, you also must know the fellowship of his sufferings. So that means that there's a place in sufferings that allows us to be able to grow in faith. Now, we don't like that message, but it's a fact of life. And we can turn to like that message if we realize that it's an opportunity. Suffering is an opportunity. I can remember a time in my life that I just sang to you about that I thought I would never crawl out of again. I couldn't understand it. And if you heard the message, part of my words were, Lord, just take me home. I believe in you. Just get me out of here because I'm not hearing anything that makes any sense to me. There's nobody that has something to say to me that is working for me. And you know how many people came to me and said, your faith is really growing. God is really raising a giant. I didn't feel like a giant. <laughs> I felt like a midget faith. I felt like somebody that was about to get kicked and booted all around the place like I had been. And so in that sense, I had to look back after I came through that horrendous time in my life and realize that God used that time to hone so many different levels of faith and obedience and test me in so many different ways. And now, you can hear me say years later, I would not trade that experience for anything. Because I know that if I hadn't gone through that experience, I could have found myself being the same person that I'm preaching about. That I could be in the business of the ministry, seeking fame and books and television and all of those things that were luring me and that were there in my grasp to have, except for the fear of the Lord. The greatest faith we can hold on to, the greatest catalyst of our faith is the fear of the Lord. If you fear God above all other things, all your other fears begin to become less. Fear God, because at the end of the day, you will be challenged in almost every facet of your religious beliefs to the point that you will say, okay, I'm not going to be afraid of that or I'm not going to do that because it doesn't matter. That's bold righteousness that works against God. We want the bold righteousness that works with God. And that says, Lord, I fear you. I fear you. I thank you that I made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. But I have a right measure of faith. Now, having said that, each is according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. God has assigned you a measure of faith. That doesn't mean that it's restricted. 
it doesn't mean that it won't grow. It doesn't mean that it's only going to be at one level and your level of faith is going to stay at one level. A measure to the Lord means that you have access to him who is faith. And he's assigned you the legal authority and right, but more so, he's re recreated you, a spirit within you that can know faith, walk in faith, and receive his faith, looking at the broader context. Now, great faith, we know, great faith isn't necessary to move a mountain, is it? He says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, speak to this mountain and it shall be removed. There's a reason the Lord said that. Because we believe that somehow, like everything else in our physical lives and in our secular lives, that we need to attain so many things to get to a place that has a greater stature than where we came from. You don't need to attain anything to have a great faith. You don't need to attain anything to have a faith that moves a mountain. You need to exercise it because it's already there. You have the measure of faith. And if you exercise it, now you have the opportunity to see that faith go to work. But if you're waiting to get to a different level in order to say, well, now I might be qualified to use that measure of faith, then you're really never using it. You're always waking it. The pendulum moves from hope to faith. Faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope doesn't have substance. Hope is anything that we want to call it, but hope is a start. The pendulum goes from hope to faith, and in between, there's substance. Substance is what defines faith. Substance is what faith manifests. Hope doesn't manifest anything. It's faith. And so, I liken it back to the, the scriptures we were reading. Jesus walking on the water. Now, Peter, for some reason, he's the one who spoke out, and it had to be the Holy Spirit inspiring him, because he says, Lord, if that's you, call me out on the water. Call me out. He was basically putting a demand and a test on the Lord, but in essence, in a way, he was making a faith statement, wasn't he? And what happened was the Lord said two words, come on, come on, same thing in your lives. Lord, will you do this? Come on, meet me. Meet me on the water. Meet me in the miracle. Come on. We want the miracle to fall upon our heads and just do nothing. And that'll happen. But the Lord says, come on, meet me in the miracle. Meet me in the miracle. Come on. Peter gets out of the boat, starts to walk. And all of a sudden, he becomes aware of his own lack of belief system, and he begins to sink. He cries out, Lord, save me. Well, he probably was asking for more than he thought because he was about to get his whole soul saved. Lord, save me. And then the Lord reached out by his hand, put him back in the boat. And then the circumstances calmed down. They calmed down. The wind went away. The wind was a test, and the Lord was in the wind. But he was substance. Who was the substance? Jesus was the substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That was a moment of perfect faith. Peter was walking in a moment of perfect faith. He was defying nature. He was walking on water, defying gravity, defying anything that is possible. He was able to do it because he had a moment of perfect faith. Not that he could find in himself. Listen to this. He found it by a declaration of Jesus. Come on. He asked, Jesus said, come on, a declaration, come on. Now, we have choices in our lives. We have choices in our lives. We have times and moments when we can say, you know what, I'm, I'm done with that. I, I, I've had it. I don't want to hear this stuff anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm laying it down. Or we can embrace it and say, I don't like this. you got to be a fool to say you like pain. But you know what, Lord, you're in the pain. You are in the wind. You're in the storm. Come on. You know, I was, uh, I think it was JP I was telling about uh, Forrest Gump's movie. And uh, Lieutenant Dan, remember Lieutenant Dan, his legs were cut off? And uh, Lieutenant Dan was bitter. And he went to join uh, Forrest Gump on a shrimp boat. 
And uh, he crawled up on the mast. And he's screaming and yelling at the storm. Is that all you got? Come on, bring it on. Is that what you got? And he's cursing and cussing. And he's yelling at God. If that's all you got, bring it on. I can handle it. Hey! That's what he did, didn't he? But it had a little change in his life. He actually, I think, came to a conclusion in the midst of the storm that God was in the storm. He met Jesus in the storm. I don't know about you, but my greatest moments of faith have been meeting Jesus in the storm. When there's really been no other alternative but for the Lord to show up. But for the Lord to show up. I'm not going to make it about me and start sharing testimonies. I've seen the dead rise. I've seen rain come in a drought in the desert. I've seen eyes open. I've also prayed and seen no answers. Especially when it's a loved one especially when you're connected it's family in the church especially when you're crying out to the lord lord do this do this lord and you don't get the answer that you were asking for that's when we have to say the lord is in the storm that's when we have to say lord i don't have it but i know come on how about bring it on come on that's what that's what Jesus was saying to Peter, bring it on. You know, Jesus was a man's man. Peter was a tough guy. Peter, you know, Peter didn't go to rabbinical school. We don't even know he went to any school. He was a fisherman. In fact, when he was preaching and everybody listened to him, they couldn't believe it was him. Who's this fisherman that's talking so eloquent? Where'd he get all of this at? Jesus dealt with Peter like a man's man. Bring it on. Bring it on, Peter. And he walked out of the boat. And then Jesus lifted him back out of it. The substance for perfect faith is Jesus Christ. That's on the swing of the pendulum. At the lowest level, it's survival faith. Survival faith basically says, I have needs, so I go to God. Lord, I need this. Help me! Now, the Lord's in the survival faith, too. But it's a little better when we take it to the next level. We say, Lord, I believe you. You got it. You got it. You do it. I don't understand what you're doing and how you're going to do it, but I declare the hand of the Lord in this right now in Jesus' name. Survival faith reacts to circumstances. A greater faith and a faith that moves in the substance of perfect faith already takes dominion over the circumstances. One's reactive. Survival faith reacts, right? But perfect faith takes authority. Perfect faith says, I'm not seeing what I'm seeing. I'm not hearing what I'm hearing. Death, you cannot steal me. Life, you will not own me. Whatever it is, whatever it is, I have faith that God, you've got it. You've got it. That's dominion faith. It's dominion faith. You see, a lot of times when we hear messages about faith, it was one of the first ones I ever heard. Sandy Colkin gave it. I was a young buck Messianic Jew. I didn't even know what a Messianic Jew was. All I know is I got thrown out of the temple because I believed in Jesus. So he told me I was a Messianic Jew because he was one. I went to go see him because somebody told me he had a similar experience. So I sat down. I said, what happened? And uh, I went to hear him go speak at the Catholic Church. He spoke St. Rose and Gerard or somewhere. I forget where he spoke. Patty would know. It was, it was a, doing the charismatic thing with the Catholics. And, and he gave a message on faith. And his message on faith, since then I've heard it many times, and you have too. It was about David. And David was a little shepherd boy. And David was out on the, out on the, on the pasture land. And he was all by himself. And all he had was a flute and his staff. And a bear came and stole one of his one of his lambs one of his sheep and he went and got the bear and he killed the bear and he took back his sheep and that wasn't enough the lord sent a lion and so he had to go get the lion and kill the lion and he got bear faith and then lion faith and then goliath faith and then kingdom faith but you see i don't think it was great faith that moved david i actually think it was just pure simple infant faith that moved David with Goliath. And what it was was the fear of the Lord. 
If you recall, he gives us a little key to it. He says, who is this heathen that is cursing the name of the God of Israel? Who is this heathen that dares to stand before Israel and curse God? Basically, he was saying, okay, Lord, come on, let's go get him. It ended up becoming perfect faith because the substance was God. David was nothing more than the modem that God used. Isn't it wonderful when you are nothing more than the modem that God uses and it's him? It sort of takes away the stress. It takes away the anxiety and the nervousness and the agitation. Because you just say, Lord, here I am. Bring it on. Come on. Great faith moves into perfect faith. Perfect faith is simple. Perfect faith is you joined with God. That's perfect faith. Survival faith is okay, but survival faith is desperate. Survival faith is begging. Survival faith isn't intimacy. Remember the Nigerian man in his own house with his wife? They hardly spoke and lived in different rooms of the house. Oh, I left out another part. He was wealthy. And uh, they had servants, and the servants, different servants for each other. <laughs> Reminds me of Ike and Tina. Remember Ike and Tina Turner? Yeah. Well, I, I brought them into town when I was in my younger days, and I picked them up for the limousine at the airport. We had to get two limousines because they didn't travel together, and they each had the Ikeettes and the Turnettes, and they hated each other. Who would have thought? That's what happens when we try to separate God from ourselves with survival faith. There's no relationship. There's no intimacy. God isn't in it. So perfect faith, moving faith, faith that moves. It's a low-level faith, but it can grow greater. Now, I'm going to conclude with this. I just learned and read. In fact, I think I've heard this a little bit before, but it never jumped on me. But back in 2000, like eight, nine years ago. So it'd be like about the same time, 2013 or so. There was a discovery made of seeds and um, very interesting seeds. And it was the uh, Judea date palm seed that was discovered. Now, that was found in a couple different places, but one of the greatest discoveries was in a cave in Qumran and there was a, a, a container of seeds. And they weren't sure what the seeds were at first until they tried to plant one of them. And they found out later that these seeds were preserved for over 2,000 years. And these are the biblical Judea palm seeds, uh, trees that are spoken of in the Bible about these dates that are so luscious and they're like steaks. And I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you like dates or not. Prunes for everybody as far as I'm concerned. But, but these dates were so good that they would export them to the Roman Empire. And that uh, all of the Caesars and, and the different generals and that, the things they would bring back with them were these precious dates that also had healing powers in them. They had different nutrients and things in them and people could have different uh, infirmities in their bodies healed by eating these, these dates, these biblical dates. Well, they found these dates, these little seeds. These little seeds that had somehow dried out but they were preserved for a couple thousand years. And uh, one Israeli scientist, he began to plant them. And they gave them names. And the last one he just planted was, was called um, uh, Keturah. But he also planted these names. Think, look at these names. He called one Methuselah, another Adam, another Jonah, another Hannah. And interesting thing about these dates, unlike many other fruits or, or things, it requires both a male and a female tree to pollinate. And there had to be both male and female seeds. And the other interesting thing about it is if you try to irrigate them too fast, they die. You have to take your time and irrigate them. And so this fellow figured it out, and he planted them on a kibbutz, and this kibbutz is beginning to grow these biblical dates. Hmm. When was the church born? 2,000 years ago? Help me out, professor. 
Do you know it's you, Shirley? Cheryl? 2,000 years ago. Church was born 2,000 years ago, right? Out of Jesus, the water and the blood. The church. The dates, the seeds, are 2,000 years old. It takes a male and a female, the bride and the groom, for that which God had promised biblically to come forth in this hour and in this time. The seeds, the seeds, the seeds of faith, the seeds inside of you. Seeds are very important. So those faith seeds that we continue to plant inside of ourselves and declare and practice, they grow. They grow. And when the bride joins the seed to the groom, you get perfect faith. Jesus and you, every seed will grow for you with Jesus. Every seed. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in the house. I just want to pray for you right now. I want you to be able to look through the clouds and the darkness, through the problems, the situations, the infirmities, the challenges. Many of us, many of you, you just need to quit counting the days into the future. <laughs> counting the days into the future can become frightening. You know what happens when people count the days into the future? Then every day that's gone, they thought they lost one instead of they gained one. Look at the future as gain, not as loss. Right? Because if we start looking backwards, all we can do is have regrets. If we start looking forwards, then that's the hope that brings the substance of faith, that merges our seed of faith with the promise of he who is faith. And we become married in faith. Amen. Ralph, you got a song out of that, didn't you? He's smiling. Ralph gets songs. Um, I think it's a pretty good song right there. You better get that one, Ralph, before it goes away. I want to pray for you. I want to pray so that if you hold on to it today and take it with you as you leave here and, and apply this to your circumstances and to your life, that you can lift your soul lift your spirit and allow yourself to really see intimately that you're merging with Jesus not just know him but know the power of his resurrection know the fellowship of his sufferings and you understand that the, the greatest seed of life ever planted was his death what did it say in Genesis I will bruise your seed, serpent, with the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. The greatest seed ever planted is in you and in me. Father, we thank you, Lord, for that measure of faith. We're not asking for it. You said ask for wisdom if we want it, but you told us you've given us the measure of faith, Lord, so we thank you for it. Now, Father, water it Water it with hope. Water it with our tears if you must. Water it with your love. Water it with your word. Water it with our words. Water it, Father. Water that seed, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to just pour your life upon it. Let that seed germinate with you, Father. All the seeds within us. Let them germinate with you, Father become joined to you, Jesus, inseparable, immeasurable, pressed down, abundant, overflowing, all those good things, Lord. Let those seeds grow inside of each and every person here, Lord. We thank you, Father, that seeds that have been planted by people's prayers before we could even think back and look back and know who they were and what they are and seeds that are being watered by the prayers of those who've moved on and the witnesses in the cloud in heaven and in our prayers, Father. All of the prayers, Father, we thank you, Lord, that they pour out like an incense and a water. We ask you, Father, to activate those seeds in each and every person here and wherever they are. 
and to allow those seeds, Lord, to grow and germinate and become in biblical proportions of the blessings and wonders that you have promised and that you give. Thank you for them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that no seeds in you that have been planted will ever return void. Thank you, Father. They shall harvest and bring forth the fruit that's intended of every kind, every kind bringing forth its own kind. Yes, oh Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Father. Do it as unto your word. Do it, Father, unto your glory. Do it, Father, unto your sons and daughters. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.